Hello and welcome to Mixed Metaphors, spreading the good news of books, metal, and music. Uh, so, my top 10 favorite metal albums, and this is actually as um, ranked in my uh, website. So let's see. Yeah, okay, here we go. Found it. Okay, so my top 10 favorite metal albums. And you can see the top 25 ranking on MadThoughts2.com. Uh, the MadThoughts2.com slash 2023 slash 11 slash 18 slash top hyphen 25 hyphen metal slash. And all of the numbers in that entire thing are numerals. Okay. Number 10. And this... This list was sort of a ranked by the seat of my pants thing, but I think it turned out well nevertheless. Okay. Number 10, A Matter of Life and Death by Iron Maiden. Uh, I'll just read it out, actually. This one is both the sprawling story of a war from the opening track that does seem like the song in a CW title sequence, but still evokes the perfect feeling of not particularly being invested in your own life, and that that's influence leading this character to being wrapped up in a war, to the tracks that follow like burning husks on the battlefield. It's not only a great sort of Oscar movie story of World War I from various points of view it seems, but also what feels like an extended jam session for almost every song, or maybe every one, where they found a mountain of a melody or a rhythm and then they climb it for like seven to eight minutes. It takes a while to realize how great this stuff is, to sink into the slowness of it all. But once you do, you find that it's like sitting back and really getting invested in a high-quality movie. Number 9, Versus the World by Amonomarth. This is probably the most solid of the Amonomarth albums, and it takes everything good about their middle style and mixes it with a sort of more concentrated roughness from their earlier one. It is nine tracks of just burning stone underneath the tracks of their endless marching. Number 8, Brave New World by Iron Maiden. And then, for Iron Maiden, you have an album that feels like a particularly stormy or fun day at the beach. There seems to be something just oceanic about this album. Not in a slow or a sort of massive way, although the sound is massive at points, but a refreshing kind of sea breeze about it. Even with the sort of sweltering desert vibes of The Nomad, which feels like Power Slave on a more spread out perspective, this album just goes from refreshing breeze to refreshing windstorm, Bruce's voice perhaps hits the most, or rather, and Bruce's voice perhaps hits its most happy medium here as well. Number seven, Senjutsu by Iron Maiden. Also, this is. If you had to say, if if you had to say the newest Iron Maiden album would have very little to do, if if you had to say the newest Iron Maiden album had very little would have very little to do, at least overtly with, if what with what I would have liked them to address. Imagine how cool it would have been for them to have had a cover, for example, just a cover that treated 1984 the way they treated Blade Runner with Somewhere in Time's cover, which wasn't nearly as egregious as the, late, as the year later Megadeth album doing the same thing if, while having a band history of directly addressing events, this still hits hard, and perhaps hits all the harder, because it just feels like ten of the most organically long Iron Maiden tracks in a row, or most of them on the second disc anyway, while you have some of the most poetic lyrics, at least with Bruce's delivery of them, and the titanic sort of atmosphere of the music, that this one literally had me loading it up into my portable CD player before they let me have my phone back, I think, or no, before they let me have my computer back to load the iTunes into my phone with, on probation, on the probation train. Basically, every day anew, even multiple times a day. The Parchment is, by far, one of the best songs for Iron Maiden has ever done, to me. And the lyrics, like the thing about sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind, and reaping the whirlwind on Darkest Hour, and just really work well. It's all just such a great album and a monumental piece of work. Number six, And Justice for All by Metallica. This album is Metallica going the most Dragon Force they ever do, with the possible exception of either Death Magnetic or Kill Em All, which in their own way go hard as much as possible in as many ways as possible. With a song like One 
being a classic in video game and other circles, it's having been on at least a, or rather, it's having been on if I think at least a Guitar Hero game being prominent in my memory of their inclusion memorializing songs, as much as Dragon Forces from that album I included here through the fire and flames had been, or at least almost as much. Least almost as much. <clears throat> and it is just as wandering, or not just, but similarly so. The difference with Injustice for All is that both lyrically and musically, each song does have a pretty distinct identity. When you let yourself through the gates without being kept away about the sound of the guitars and the rest of it, including James's voice on the singing. Whether it's the title track, which was long and perhaps still is my favorite metal and Metallica song, which has one of those guitar lines that sounds like patriotic music, perhaps even just American patriotic song melodies, but you still can't quite place it, similar to Trans-Siberian Orchestra, if they weren't specifically playing Christmas sounds, but it still sounded like they were, or the incredible one-pointedness of Blackened, or the sort of wandering away and coming back nature of Eye of the Beholder. The fact that it, each of these songs has a lyric that you can put at the beginning of a stateless society essay, freedom with their exception, pull your strings, justice is done, just brings this home as being one of the greatest freedom albums of all time, although one that is definitely unpleasant to listen to, especially without having gotten into each of the songs yet. But this is also thus one of those albums where you can just listen and find new things and just integrate a lot more of it a lot. Number five, Alpen Pass by Minnenwerfer. All right, so here goes continuing with the top 10 metal albums. And perhaps for the pre written ones, maybe what I'll do is. Um, Perhaps for the pre-written ones, maybe what I'll do is read them in audio files, whereas the video ones will be extemporaneous. Not that the audio ones can't be extemporaneous, but they will be... Um, or maybe they... They might be, but they don't have to be. Top 25 metal, shoot. Uh, I know where to find it. Okay. This is a little bit of an arcane way to getting to this, but arcanity is not insanity, as they say. Has anyone ever said that in the world? Maybe I should call this, maybe I should call that this, that. Our Kennedy is not insanity. That would be hilarious. No, I've already got the title for this, but that would be a hilarious title. Okay. So now we're on album five, and album five is my top five. At number fifth favorite album is. Alpen Pass by Minnenwerfer, number five. Alpen Pass by Minnenwerfer. This is truly one of my favorite albums, and it's the rare one that you find on a black metal promotion video on YouTube. That cover with the soldier standing with his rifle drawn at the top of a mountain, aiming down at the cloudy abysses below. It's just one of the best photographs I've ever seen. It is a photograph, right? Like the Covenant cover for Morbid Angel. There's a quality to it that feels more like a painting to me. But like that one, I think it is supposed to be a photograph. And the album has all of the airiness that you would expect from a cover like that, along with all of the intensity, like a stream of cold air coming through the sky as you peer down your sights and hope you can just hold it out on this mountain here at last. It is truly a black metal classic, even though Questy just barely mentioned it, not only in his video about the 2010s metal scene, but also in his video calling its successor one of his favorite albums of March 2023, but unlike that album, which I have and do like, 
This one is not so incredibly soaked and choked in darkness that it is unpleasant. It's actually quite beautiful. Number four, Transylvanian Hunger by Dark Throne. This is the black metal album, other than Philosophem, I guess, or At the Heart of Winter, that will get you into black metal. That opening track is like a preview to the whole genre, and it's just so good. And then the rest of the album, along with the rest of their, quote, unholy trinity, unquote, with Under a Funeral Moon and A Blaze in the Northern Sky, comes off to me, or Under the Funeral Moon, like a hand reaching out from harder stuff leading you in, if you will take it. All screaming in the darkness and droning guitars and interesting words when you can hear them and understand them. Number three, Francis the Mute by the Mars Volta. Here you get an idea, along with the Hansi Kirsch and the Marilyn Manson one, that I like cabaret vocals. I like my metal musicians acting like they're up there singing show tunes sometimes. And like Gerard Way on the microphone for My Chemical Romance, Cedric Bixler Zavala soars here into purple. Number two, Joms Viking by Amonomarth. This, of all the Amonomarth albums, is the one I have returned to most. Putting it on like putting on Lost in Translation in the background on a dark night, like I used to do while I was drinking coffee and writing about Cowboy Bebop or something. It's just what I have called the Disney album of their catalog, and it feels like a story told by a really snappy, if not particularly artsy at all times, storyteller who knows how to play up what and when. You get just suitably epic and even Iron Maiden Brave New World-like guitars. I think not only does this emulate their sort of singular feel from that album, but it twists it and alters it to fit Amonomarth's aesthetic. And singing with Johan here sounding, to me, the best he ever does, and allows them to wash over the intensity of the music like a true relief. Number one, Symbolic by Death album. Number one, Symbolic by Death. This one is on their way to becoming my favorite band, with Leprosy also awesome, and the other two I have by them feeling like they're going to be growers, their first and fifth. But Symbolic, well, it has probably become my favorite metal album. There's a certain raw rage to to Chuck Schuldner's vocals, to to Chuck Schuldner's vocals, and as the Dave Mustaine of this band, he might as well be credited for the rest of the sound to some extent too. And boy, if this doesn't hit hard for me, the last line of 10,000 Eyes says it all. We are enslaved now. Raw truth or lyrics and raw morality, unapologetically moral. This isn't a guy who's going to say, hey man, everything is religion when it concerns morality because it's unverifiable. He's going to say in a raspy wail, A serpent spews out fantasy, unjustified blasphemy that cannot be condoned, or this is not a test of power, this is not a game to be lost or won, let justice be done, and those are both from the same song, song, the same song, from the same song, the same song. Thanks for the fight!